I've worked with very successful people and externally you're like oh my goodness wow but yeah. then you talk to them and internally oh you know I wasn't that good or that was a yeah. fluke that was luck that was yeah. and you're like wow there's there's a real disconnect yeah and I know I've suffered from it it's an interesting phenomenon I've dreamt that you were twisting through seven hi everybody welcome back to the sober four podcast I'm Veronica and I'm Chip. Good to have you with us. We are going to be talking about imposter syndrome today. It's another topic that I just can't believe we haven't got to in the no, six no. years we've been doing this. But uh, it came up recently in, in a couple of my sessions and I thought, oh, we must do that. Yeah. No, it's a good one. It's a good one. I think everybody, uh, I mean, I don't know about everybody, but I certainly know that everybody with uh, alcohol problems in their life suffer from this to varying degrees but you know it's a it's a sort of it's almost like a, a symptom a, an additional symptom of alcohol dependency and alcohol problems this this whole thing you know as is low self-esteem and things like that but uh imposter syndrome is definitely one that keeps on cropping up over and over again. Yeah, and I've got a definition here that was defined by two clinical psychologists, uh, Pauline Rose Clance and Suzanne Imes, and this was back in 1978. So what is imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome is the condition of feeling anxious and not experiencing success internally, despite being high-performing in external objective ways. This condition often results in people feeling like a fraud or a phony and doubting their abilities. And I think these two female psychologists kind of developed some work around it because it was a condition they observed in professional women. Um, oh, okay. So if you think if you think in like they they identified this phenomenon in 1978, that would have been just when women had entered the workforce, but were perhaps beginning to maybe get management and senior roles at that point, and in, in yeah, very, very just, male just, just, dominated. Just yeah, beginning. just, yeah. Just beginning. So, um, but I think that, I mean, I, I feel that it's almost, I, I think most people have it at different times, at different, I mean, I've, I've, it's like yourself, I've worked with very successful people and, and it's again, externally, you're like, oh my goodness, wow, yep. you know, but yep. then you talk to them and internally they're like, oh, you know, they'll have like, oh, you know, I wasn't that good or that was a yep. fluke, that was luck, that was, yep. and you're like, wow, there's, there's a real disconnect. Um, yeah. And I know I've suffered from it. it it's, it's it's an interesting phenomenon, and I do think you're right. I think the more when we have an addiction problem, I think that it can be quite right. Yes, and I think uh, you know even I don't, I picked it up in that uh, definition, which I've never heard before, but it's, it was good. Just about just about something as simple as taking a compliment, you know, somebody saying that yeah. was you did that really well, you know, and you going oh well yeah, but you know what you said or whatever, but just not. Not letting it land, just not letting it land because it's a there's a dissonance there uh, about somebody's just said something really complimentary to you and it doesn't connect with what you feel inside or tear down the compliment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that's something that uh, you really have to practice at at letting compliments land i mean i definitely recognize myself as being somebody and i mean and and still do as somebody who can demonstrate imposter syndrome i mean for me uh, you know externally i can come across probably as being competent in my job or anything but stick me in a room of uh, as i used to when i was uh, running focus and you'd kind of be in a room of 20 commissioners and people in the local council or something and for me, it would manifest itself in just not feeling that I was as clever, as qualified as everybody else. I uh, didn't feel that I belonged. They all obviously knew their jobs much better than I did. They had read the papers better than I had. They had a better mastery of it. And mm. just and allowing it, uh, that belief system to sort of, that I didn't fit to yes. silence, to silence me. Uh, yeah. So I didn't feel that I had 
I don't know, there's nothing I could say here that would be of any, you know, they'd all think I was stupid if I'd said something like that. And then annoyingly, half an hour into the meeting, somebody would say something I thought of half an hour ago, and everybody go, oh, yes, absolutely. That's just exactly the right. I'd get so annoyed that I had allowed my kind of inner imposter or whatever, however one describes it, to dominate my behavior to the point whereby it silenced me and allowed other people, not that I mind other people, you know, saying the right thing, but uh, I could have said something just as valid, uh, but didn't allow myself to because I didn't feel that I fit. There's a lot of things at play with imposter syndrome, and it feels like a lot of things get out of balance. So, I mean, we're not talking about humility. We're not talking about like, you know, being humble about your achievements, which is a great great trait to have it it's kind yeah. of it's more it's more of a feeling like I, I I can only describe it myself I would often feel like I th- there was some kind of fluke or there was some kind of like mistake happened and they yeah. thought I could do the job but really they have no idea I'm completely going to be terrible it, it, it's that kind of feeling but there's there's the, what you described there is it plays into our limiting beliefs about ourselves yeah um, there's there's a lot of shame about it. I, I mean, you can just see how this comes from childhood. It, it's also yes. a cognitive distortion because, again, I can't remember. So many times I've had professional people who've really achieved things, and I've been like, "Wow, that's impressive!" And they're just like, "No, it's not. You're you're you're, yeah. you're not see, you're not seeing it right. That's not. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's all you know. It's interesting our perception, isn't it? What we would perceive, and then what someone else would perceive. And it's also very ill-defined, right? Again, I've done that. I've achieved something, and for like enjoyed it for like ten seconds, and then been like, sure. oh, "I can't be that. Can't can't be that hard if I did it. Can't be. Yeah. A, can't can't actually be a big deal if I did it. It, yeah. it." There's a real cognitive distortion going on. So there's a lot of things in play, and things get out of balance, and it, it's very anxiety-producing because when you feel like this, you have a constant feeling that you're going to get found out. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, when I was uh, sort of the example I gave just now, sitting around a table of other professionals uh, in the same field, you know, just almost kind of dreading the conversation coming around to me or somebody saying, what do you think, Chip? Because I just knew I was going to mess it up. And, and the fact of the matter is that did not match actually my experience and my knowledge. I was really doing myself down by believing this because I, you know, there'd often be as times I'd be sitting in a room, I would be far and away the most experienced person there. And yet I would allow this f- sense of being an imposter to dominate me so much that I would be silent and be, an- as you said, anxious about getting asked to say something for fear of then, then they would really discover uh, that I was an imposter and that I didn't fit and they'd all be, you know, uh, for me, it's been something that has silenced me from voicing my opinion because I always thought I was going to get it wrong. And I can tr- definitely trace that back to childhood messaging, childhood training. Even things like voicing an opinion was considered uh, showing off. So, you know, you kind of, it, it, I, I definitely can see where my early childhood and the messaging I was given made me kind of very anxious about believing that what I said had merit. And Mm. as a result, I would often not voice it because I couldn't convince myself that my belief or my voice had merit, value, and knowledge and experience behind it. It just, I'm so annoyed now that I, well, certainly historically, and also sometimes Currently, you know, in the present life, I can allow myself to be silenced by this belief that I don't belong. I'm in the wrong place. I am an imposter here. I am the odd one out. Everybody else is more knowledgeable, experienced. And it just frustrates me um, that I have missed so many opportunities to sort of say something of value and allow that inner voice to say, no, shut up, Chip. You don't know what you're talking about. In social situations, it's not just a business in actually i think probably in social situations do i belong here is my friendship with these people as valid as i th- it, 
it's supposed to be. I mean, are these people really my friends or am, am I just kind of part of this group? I don't know because do they feel sympathetic. sorry for me? Do they feel sorry yeah, for me? Yeah, is, exactly. am, I a, am I a sympathy kind of? Exactly. Yeah. 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 We better yeah. ask shit because otherwise, yeah. And 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 do I really belong in this friendship group? And sometimes every once in a blue moon, I'll I'll I, I think I've used this example before in this podcast, but we've done so many, maybe people will have forgotten. But there was a group of old friends when we all got cleaned together. There was a group of old friends, and and we'd. Occasionally, they'd meet up, uh, especially when one of them flew over from Australia, and uh, you know they'd all get together. And, okay, well, she's going to be here, and we'll all get together. And I would never get invited to that group lunch or that group afternoon tea or whatever it was. And I used to think, oh my god, was I really a part of that group of friendship? And I, or I see photographs of activities from the past, and I'm never in the group in the photograph. And I do kind of think. Oh, did I really? Were they really my friends? Or yeah, it can it can really get me to doubt. It causes doubt in my mind, and that frustrates me. So have it, we can have imposter syndrome in our certainly in our work environments, but we can also have them in our peer groups, which is yep. what you've just described. Is that that feeling that you're and what we're doing? What you described there is what we do is we judge our insides by other people's outsides, right? We look mm -hmm. at we're in a group. We think, oh, they all, you know, they're all confident. Their careers are coming on. They've just bought a house, yeah. da, 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 da. and they just everything's going so well for them, and it's not going so well for me. And I mean, this is what most people do. I do it. We do it. We judge. Yeah. We look at the outside of someone's life, and we think, oh, that looks fine. Yep. And we judge it against how we feel about ourselves inside, which is um, often inadequate and not good enough, all those kind of things. And that's a faulty comparison because yep. everybody, everybody has stuff going on. Everybody, yep. everyone has struggles. So to, to, to be human is to struggle. So everybody has some struggles and some feelings of inadequacy and failure and shame and all of that kind of stuff. And they're, they're just managing them. You know, all, all I think we're trying to do is manage them as best we can. Yeah. It's, it's fun. As you were talking just then, I really thought of an example in Muller. This house that Heidi and I live in, mm. we have no mortgage on it. We've paid for it outright. It's only a little house. It's a little two up, two down in a lovely little village. It looks very pretty from the outside. And... For, for her and I to own a house outright is absolutely amazing, especially with my history and everything like that. Mm. It's incredible. But the number of times I will talk to people, there's something about me kind of diminishing, like I don't belong amongst other homeowners. Um, and, mm. you know, and I'll say, well, yeah, you know, it's, we we do own a house, but it's only a tiny little thing, and it's you know it's not it's only got room, and I'll kind of really diminish it. And it's a beautiful little house, and we love it, and you know it suits our needs. But the number of times I feel that I kind of don't belong in the homeowners club, and I that I have run down this house so often uh, when I'm talking to people, and actually rather than go, yeah, we've. We've got a, a little house in the country, no mortgage or something, and be really proud of that. Mm. I, I, I run it down, and uh, and because I mean, because it is a small house, and I know that you know most other people's houses are bigger than it than than, than this, but it doesn't matter. It's we we own it, and it's your little piece of paradise, isn't it? It's your little yeah, and it's for, little... for for us with our history. That's incredible. I diminish my achievement by by allowing that limiting belief about you know what mm. to take dominance over my thinking and I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to st actually now that I've had this you know we've had this. I'm glad talk, this show uh, is therapy for you too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. Uh, but <laughs> well, I mean, I think uh, I think I think everything is. I mean, I think all conversations and whatever mm. it is. I think it's it's all therapy. I'm learning. It's all process. It's all yeah, process. Yeah, I'm all it's learning. All I'm learning from other people all the time. I met somebody last night and, you know, we were, had a long chat and, you know, I learned stuff. Well, I'm always learning stuff, always learning stuff, but I'm going to stop doing that. So, uh, good. Thank you for that a little bit. Uh, I'll uh, send you your fee later. Yeah. No, thank you. That's great. So yeah. what, uh, what can happen when we... Imposter syndrome takes hold 
is it can lead to self-sabotage, yeah. is that we can then begin to sabotage our achievements and um, undervalue our contributions, all, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, that's like when I've worked with people, you know, in jobs and I, whenever, you know, this is just a, I used to go through this process. Whenever you get a new job, I get, I'm really good at interviews. I interview really well and I get the job and then I'd go, oh, crap. Oh, I don't know what yeah. to do. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I don't know what this is. They keep sending me things to read and none of it makes any sense. And they're going to realize that they made a mistake and I'm just an idiot. And did the... and um, that would happen every new job that I've ever had. And then eventually I stick with it and I ask questions and I figure things out and then it just becomes my new normal and I can just do yeah. it and it's all right. Um, but I would always go through that, that agonizing process. And I know I can, re- I, I know for sure in the past, particularly when I was drinking, I would just tear it down. I would just sabotage it. I would just find a way out of it because the the fear was just so much. And I was so convinced there'd been some kind of error or mistake and I'm just going to spectacularly fail. Best to just, so I I know I've sabotaged opportunities and I see, I see people do this sometimes. I see other people. I remember once I met a, new, a, a woman, she was a mother and she was a nutritionist and she was home with her kids and she talked passionately about her training and how she loved helping people find the right food to eat. And she was so passionate about it. And I said to her, I said, oh, that's really, you know, I have some coaching programs. It, it, you, it'd be great for you to come, like, come and do a mm-hmm. session. It'd be really yeah. interesting for my client group. And she was all lit up, like, oh my God. And I was like, yeah, it's really, it'd be really helpful for people when they first get sober and, and did la la and and I, I think I emailed her and said, I'm thinking this, you know, it did. Anyway, she emailed back after a few days saying, I've thought about it. And well, you know, with the kids and this, and, and I'm really, you know, I still need to do further research and thanks so much for the opportunity. And, 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 but she's, you know, when I spoke to her, she's talking about like her love being a mom, but her frustration with not working, really wanted to do something, really wanted to do something of worth and value like I'd seen how lit up she was and how like, yep. and, and I was just talking like an hour here or there, like talking yep. to my people. And I saw her like in the email was just all of these. And, and the result was she's just going to stay at home and not do it. And, and I just thought that's so interesting yep. that you, and I was like, okay, then fine, whatever you want to do. But it was yep. so interesting to me to watch her do that process of, who, I mean, who knows that probably for her, if she'd have done that, probably would have led to, to some clients. Somebody would, would have reached out and said, oh, sure. I'd really like to work with you about my, you know, yep. cholesterol or whatever. Yeah. Um, and it was really interesting that, she, so she not she qualified and done her experience, but not really worked and how she had sabotaged herself with not ever getting, who knows what she's doing now. But I've seen other people do that as well, how we just create all these external reasons why we can't, we, can't, we just can't. can't. And it's belong. not anything to yeah. do with us. Yeah. And I've just thought of another one, which actually I'm really hot on when I see people do it, is in, uh, you know, the Sober Fall Friday group or any group of people who are uh, kind of sober. And you'll hear people say, oh, yeah, but I'm, I, I, you know, I'm I'm only six months clean. So, you know, I I don't, you know, I know you're all much cleaner than me or something. And I'll go, whoa, 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 stop, stop. Why, you know, what's wrong with being only six months? Why does that diminish? But you hear it a lot where people feel that because they've only got a little bit of clean time or only got so much, maybe they see somebody else in the group who they've got uh, X number of years or something. And it just completely makes them feel as if they are kind of an imposter and they're faking it. And they will say, well, you know, I'm only this and that. And I, I'm, I'm always really hot to stop it and go, no, 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 you own it. You know, you've got, you've got some clean time. It's fantastic. Don't diminish it by saying, well, I've only got it. So I'm not really sure it's okay for me to say this, but you know, I think such and such. And as I said, I'm, I'm always really hot on, on making people, not making people, but encouraging people to really take ownership of, of, of that and not to think that they are an imposter because there are other people who are cleaner than them or got more clean, more sobriety. There's always going to be people who have got more sobriety than that. And we've all had, got, will have imposter syndrome in various situations, probably. Um, it's how much 
we allow that to dominate? Because, I mean, I have obviously seen people with such chronic imposter syndrome that, it, it, as you said, it kind of really makes them shy, withdrawn. I'm not even qualified to speak at all here. You know, it silences them completely. And that's that's really sad to see that uh, people uh, who've got something really valuable to say, and more often than not in groups, it's uh, somebody voicing uh, that they're frightened or scared that is the thing that resonates with most people. And they all go, well, that's exactly how we feel as well. But just trying to, if you recognize as you're listening to this, well, yeah, I do tend to sort of, diminish i allow my imposter syndrome to dominate my thinking about what i've achieved or how i live my life or how my relationship is or something like that you know and it's not something that is set in stone you can change it it's 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 something that you can you can overcome i think the fear is because where it collides because there's all these different things in play is our fear of being arrogant so yes i think that and this is interesting to observe culturally. I, in England, I think that we have a very much have a don't think too much of yourself yeah. kind of thing. Stop showing I, off. I'm also, yeah. Yes, yeah. But I'm also, well, it's interesting because you kind of grew up in this world. I, I also think with our class system, I just think of some of the British politicians we have who seem to have absolutely no doubt of their abilities whatsoever and are clearly not as... Into, total you know, sense of entitlement. Total yeah, sense of yeah, entitlement. Yeah, so, yeah. And I think that's due to our class system more yep. than – and, and so in America, I feel like in America, success, you're allowed to be successful and you're yep. allowed to be proud of your success and accomplishments yep. and achievements in a way yep. that's never struck me as being – I mean, I, I I don't really think it, it doesn't strike me as arrogant in a lot of cases. I mean, sometimes, but um, so I think that we have can almost have a pathological fear of appearing arrogant, which I think if you're British and for some people, like we would rather die. But yes. to that end, what we do then is just like tear everything down and don't like, yeah, you're like, I'm really... Like me and Heidi are in a good place. We've got this lovely little cottage and we don't have yeah. any, you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it's just like, it's not about, I don't know, like every time you meet Chip, that's all he talks about kind of yeah. thing. It's yeah. just like as and when it's appropriate that, oh, yeah, yeah. I think there definitely is a, a class system thing at, at, at play. And I can think of a friend of mine who will often uh, say something like, oh, well, I'm not posh like you or something like that. And it's like, yeah, but you speak mm. a lot of sense and you say some really great things, but you're not allowing yourself to, because you you think that because I'm, I can't help my background. And uh, I, I, actually, and that's another place where, it, I mean, actually, the more I think about it, the more I, I, I do think there is a problem with class in, in this country still, actually. Yeah, um, I do as well. In, in the fact that we kind of revere people uh, who don't, who d really don't merit uh, reverence. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, because they speak properly, uh, whatever, you know, and they are uh, a lot of people who kind of, in the presence of somebody who's speaking in a very posh way, will silence themselves because they don't think their voice is, is important. And I think uh, that is still prevalent in this country. Um, I think it's thankfully going as we have seen uh, what a mess they've made of things but uh, the sort of cliche situation I've you know you go to a bar in America and you'll get a businessman sitting next to a farmer and sitting next to a worker and there is no sort of there's much less sense of well I can't possibly be seen sitting here you know there's a much more egalitarian um, maybe my um, I'm sort of slightly idealizing American uh, society because I'm sure obviously it does exist out there at all I, I feel them I feel in America, and I'd love for any Americans to weigh in on this, because again, I'm a Brit living here observing this. I feel that they have their own class system and it's about going to college. So right. it's about going, like going to college is a really big thing. Obsession sort of Ivy League colleges. Class. Yeah. No, this is, this is just going to college and then oh, okay. it's going to a top college. So if you right. went to a top college, that's 
like the high class if you went to college that's that's i don't want to say middle class but it, it is middle class yeah, yeah and if you're if you're what's known as blue collar which you didn't go to college but maybe you went to a technical school and learned how to be an electrician or something like that yeah. that is like i feel that that those things are uh, and then also i think with accents the same as they are in england but now i live in the south i really have noticed how uh, like like a southern accent in the same way as like I grew up in Norfolk and England. Norfolk accent is the equivalent to a southern yeah, accent. Yeah. It's like okay, it's seen yeah. as as country, yeah. country so simpler folk, you know. Yeah. And and I, so I, I feel so I feel I feel it exists in different ways. But there is just something I, I do love about America, which is you're not you're allowed to be successful. Where I don't think feel that mm. you are so much in the UK. But yeah, there, so there's all these uh, there's lots of complicated things going on that we have to kind of resolve in ourselves because like when you said we're all whatever you're doing I I was actually thinking about this the other day I was thinking about like when I first started working as a psychotherapist and I was working at Focus and doing other things like Mm -hmm. what I know now compared to what like 20 years ago like I've been a therapist for over 20 years like like what I know now, like I knew nothing but I still help people right I look, look back and think god I knew nothing Oh, so and how much that continues to grow and, and change and you kind of take on board new I, practices and information and data and all of that kind of stuff and and how that will continue I think there's a careful balance in managing that we are where we are and it's okay not to know and I think there's also I think what plays into this is a fear of making mistakes as well sure like yeah. any mistake is just absolute evidence that I, I'm in the wrong place and I shouldn't be doing this and everyone's right, I'm going to be a failure. So I think there's just, there's a lot of internal things that we have to manage. Yeah, and, I, and I'm and i going to say something now, I'm not quite, I, I've been thinking about it in the last couple of minutes, I'm not quite sure whether it fits or not. But I think in, in the world of uh, sort of sobriety and recognizing whether one has an alcohol problem or not, there is a kind of, uh, and this is a theory I've not, obviously you'll hear in a minute, how I've not really thought it through or worked it out properly. But there's a sort of reverse imposter syndrome whereby we don't think we could possibly be an, somebody with an alcohol problem because we are not sitting on a park bench or something. Yes. And, I, and I have definitely, in uh, the self-help group that I go to, been told because I come from a good background, that I can't possibly belong uh, with sort of street addicts and things like that. I mean, as I said, they don't know anything about my history. I know exactly where I fit. But mm. there's that kind of slight reverse imposter syndrome, if that makes I, As I said, I know kind of what I'm trying to say, but I'm not saying it very well, that we can think that we don't belong, that we are imposters mm. because... You know, you hear people go like who go to since you know I say it, who go to AA meetings or something, and they come from a good background and they think, oh well, I I don't think I really belong there because you know, mm. and actually, yeah, you you do belong. Um, you're not an imposter at all, and I'm sure I could probably, given a bit of time, which I haven't got now, I could actually develop that theory a little bit more. But there is something about not belonging, feeling like an imposter that can really play into people who um, attend groups of any kind, comparing themselves to other people and feeling that they don't belong for various reasons. I I actually would go with that because that's how I felt when I went to AA, because I was considerably younger. Mm -hmm. I didn't drink every day. I'd never had a DUI. Like all the, again, what we're talking about here is internal and external. So yeah. I would sit in large meetings and hear all these external tales of which most of which hadn't happened to me. Sure. And I, I think the gift for me then was there wasn't any other choices of anywhere else to go. And I was just really scared. So I kept going. And then I heard someone talk about the internal. Then I heard someone talk about that fear was the guiding force of their life. And they were frightened of everything and anything and nothing. And they drank because of fear. And then I went, oh, that's me. Yeah, yeah, and then all of that like doubt of like, am I in the wrong? Like, I don't know. Like, none yeah. of this happened. Like, yes. maybe I just need to cut down. Like, I kept going until I heard. Thankfully, and what I can remember it to this day. Once I'd heard that, I was like, "That's me." Oh, I yeah. 
I'm in the right place. Right, the steps. Yeah. Where do I do those? And when, yeah. when, when do you start? Because I'll start those immediately. Yeah. So it, it's a, it, what you're talking about. It, it, it fits. It's about the external. It's the relationship between the external and the internal. It's mm-hmm. the relationship between yeah. what we see on the outside of other people and what we're feeling on the inside and, tr- yes. and trying to, to manage that. And it's that relationship, isn't it? Yes. And we can, yeah. so we can do that. We can do that because what we're, in some ways, what we're talking about is almost about fitting in, isn't it? And when you have imposter syndrome, you don't feel like don't you feel fit like in. Fit in, yeah. You know, the question is again. I've been thinking is, but okay, well, where does this come from? And I know that a lot of the things that the sort of things that we've talked about earlier on are messages that I was given uh, when I was young about, oh, you're not, you know, you're not clever enough. Stop showing off. You know, be quiet. Uh, things that sort of quietened me down and started diminishing the sort of the person who was actually wanting to be funny and uh, uh, wanting to be whatever, just his natural self. Uh, and certainly within the academic system that I went through, it was very much about, you know, you are not as clever as this person who's standing in front of you teaching you. You're not as clever as that. So it kind of gets bred into you, certainly in my life, uh, by my family and the messaging I got from my family, um, where, I mean, I didn't even think I fit I fit in my family. Uh, that was the extent of my kind of, I mean, I would often think that I had been adopted uh, because I thought I was so out of sync with the way I felt like that an my, alien in my family, yeah. like a like I, yeah. complete alien. <laughs> Yeah, and I used to think maybe I was adopted because I just don't think like these people, you know. And, <laughs> don't see the uh, world the same way. I, I really no, I don't see the yeah. same the world the same way. And what's how did that happen? How did I? What is the? How did I land here? I must have impostered my way in here somehow. Um, but yes, I think it. If you are nurtured properly in early life to kind of believe in yourself and to kind of. Uh, be able to kind of take credit for stuff and to be able to kind of acknowledge that you've done something well uh, without, uh, you know, teetering over into arrogance and showing off and that kind of entitlement. If you can get that balance right in the early days, it's going to give you a much better foundation later on. And obviously, because this podcast is directed mostly with people with alcohol uh, dependence of some form or other or recovery from. I don't know many people who, uh, you know, later on in life develop alcohol dependency who've come from an environment that has been supportive and encouraging. And, and I therefore think that what we're talking about today, I think is a very, very common behavioral trait amongst people with alcohol dependency. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could go back and relive your life knowing everything you know now? <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. I often Wouldn't... think that, like, especially yeah. around romantic relationships, like, oh, man, I'd love to go back to my 20s knowing what I know now. Yeah. Wouldn't it be lovely? Yeah. God. It's... Life would have been so much easier, wouldn't it? Um, I know. I know. Yeah. Wisdom, right, comes along Wisd- when, yeah. you, <laughs> yeah. when you don't, <laughs> when you've got it figured out oh. a bit. <laughs> Oh. It's an interesting radio program going on at the moment about basically uh, doing something that I'm sure you've done in your therapy as well is getting people to kind of write letters to themselves when they were younger and, you know, mm. uh, what advice would you give the younger version of yourself? There's a sort of radio program going on at the moment, a, a kind of an, a, an adaptation of that kind of thing where people have been asked to reflect on what advice would you give your younger self now that you know what you know mm. and stuff like that. Mm. And, and actually, practically all of them said, I wish I had better self-belief. A lot of them wishing that they hadn't allowed their imposter uh, personality to dominate them as much as they as they had done, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, just to wrap it up about imposter syndrome, when it gets out of control, we're just going to live in this continuous fear of not living up to expectations. And yeah. and those expectations are very vague. You know, it's it, we, we, it doesn't matter how many goals we set or things we achieve, the goalposts keep keep moving. Yeah. And, and eventually we burn out. And of course, where alcohol fits into all of this, that's a very stressful and, and anxiety provoking way to live. 
and of yep. course that's one of the reasons that we drink to relieve the the pressure and the and the feelings of all of that so um it, it's important to kind of have a look at where imposter syndrome is showing up in your yes. life yeah um because there is ways to it, it, it it's about balancing it it's about it it's okay it, you know it's okay not to know it's okay to be like you know not have checked the boxes that other people have checked yeah. you know our, our it's about our worth is not in the external things our worth is in the internal things and feelings inside and uh that takes a bit of work to get there yeah, it takes a bit it of does. work and and as you were saying that just i was thinking god i love the person at meetings i love the person who says i don't understand or i didn't understand what you were saying yeah. i love that person because yeah i can guarantee that if they didn't mm. understand it i didn't either but i haven't had the balls or whatever to say mm. i don't understand that and i love the person who's got the courage yeah. to say yeah i don't understand uh yeah you know and i the, Oh my God, that, those people are just. Gold. And you can tell, I've yeah. been in those situations where someone said, I, like, I, I don't get it. And you can almost hear, feel this collective kind of like, oh, I'm so glad that somebody's voiced what I was thinking. I was just sitting here pretending I got it because I didn't want anyone to think that I was, you know. And then there's a, this collective sigh of relief when somebody is brave enough to go, can you explain that again? Or I don't get yeah, it or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Because that's actually how most people are feeling. Yes. And so I think I think the moral of this episode is don't judge your insides by other people's outsides. There's Absolutely. everybody, everybody has stuff going on that you yep. can't see. Everybody yep. has a struggle and they are wrestling with stuff that you can't see. And once I understood that actually helped me a lot. Because I, I genuinely believed everyone else was fine. I genuinely believed. You know, you look you look fine, Chip. Yeah. Your life was easy and fine. Yeah. I genuinely believe that. And went, which is kind of ridiculous, but I genuinely believe that. Yeah, yeah. Um, once I realized that was not true and everyone had struggles they were hiding and all that kind of stuff, it helped me a lot. I, I was that that really was like, Oh my god, thank God I'm not the only one. And and I saw and it helped me see things differently. So that yeah. was a huge benefit to me to realise that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Love to know your thoughts, especially if you're American, if you think our, um, our uh, opinions about the difference between England and America. America is a very big and complicated <laughs> place, but um, I'd love to, we'd love to know your feedback in the, on social media when you see the episode posted, and we will be back soon. Take care, yeah. everybody. Bye-bye.